What's with the photo? Shoot the other day about Ingolos Yao. That's something I've never seen before. Look at it. Okay, right. Starts working. Yeah, it's following the signs. Yo, yo, yo. Maga figure out. Since part of the man, they've been waiting for him. Got got long little old vulalit. Back calling you lost. Not a shangi lost. You couldn't miss his rule. Yes, that's it. So, Matalam Khablis, it was never about the wings, Mfano. It, it's the fire in you. Yeah. Yeah. When I first started understanding what it is, I thought Christianity was a bunch of lies. You know, is what you thought? Yeah, when I was younger, I used okay. to think it was a bunch of lies. Yeah. Uh, because you go to church, and I think a lot of people will, will um, attest to this. You get there, and people will talk about love and kindness and all this stuff. As soon as the service is over, you see all the worst behaviors come out. Mm. You go to a club, you find people from church there drinking, smoking, doing the most. This is the Hustlers Corner. Hey, hello, good afternoon, squatters and hustlers from all over the world. Big homie Spuda out here in Johannesburg, South Africa. Once again, I'm quite excited. Another beautiful episode of the Hustlers Corner. The tradition here at home is that we go straight to that shop shop sign. On the count of one, two, three, let's click it, click, 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 click that like button, click, click, thank you. And then go on the other side, click that subscription bell. Oh, the, the, and switch on the, the, what is this, the subscription bell, so you get to know when we're dropping brand new episodes. Guys, we, um, we've got a brand new podcast called Virtual Mkuku, which we are growing. I'll put the link in the description. I want you to click on that link. It's going to take you to the Virtual Mkuku YouTube channel. We want you to subscribe. Because we're going to be dropping ep two episodes starting from July. Uh, one episode on Mondays with myself and Panyol. One episode on Thursdays. That is on the virtual Mkuku platform. But the Hustlers Corner platform episodes continue as usual up until a later stage. I think around summer this year, I want to be dropping episodes every day. I'm a workhorse, guys. I'm like creating content. As I always say to people, even in real life, I'm a producer. I'm a creator. Kimurekisi. I just don't like being a consumer the whole time, consumer of everything. So even in this new all online world that we're in, we choose if we all just want to consume, 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 that's all we're going to do from on the online portals. Or are we also going to create content, write articles, write books, share books, speak to people on webinars, or communicate with the public. I think I'm inspired to do that. And that's what I've been doing, especially this year. I'm more inspired than ever before. Talking about inspiration, the person who's sitting next to me is nothing short of inspiration. She's an amazing writer. She's an entrepreneur, extremely gifted and talented. She's a multi-award winning South African musician. She's also an essayist. Yes, she was just telling me off the record behind the scenes, which she's actually more of a writer than a vocalist. But she is an amazing musician, a philanthropist, a humanitarian. She's also an entrepreneur. She's a five-time summer winner. She was winner of the two Soul Candy Dance Music Awards, Sunday Times Coolest Female Celebrity Awards, Darling Hair Awards. Lady Zama won the best collaboration at the DSTV MVCA for Charlotte with PK. She has been, she had gone double platinum, she has gone double platinum with sales and streams, jeez. Ah, I think a lot of you guys, if you're from South Africa, you are familiar with Yamikani Janet Banda, known to you and I as Lady Zama. Welcome to the Hustlers Corner. Hi, <laughs> how are you? I'm good. I didn't know that your, your name was Yamigani. Yeah, it's Yamigani. What does Yamigani mean? It means praise. Prayers. Yeah, Imitandas. Praise. praise is in... Oh, praise, praise. Oktumisa. no, I get yeah. you. Uh, and, and I just um, had some some interesting information of A. You're telling me you're actually born in my hood. Hospital yeah. View at Timbisa. Yeah. Hospital View. Um, Tell me about it. Yeah. I mean, I was a baby. <laughs> 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 I don't really know much about my birth. But yeah. um, I went to the Lorato Preschool. And um, I mean, my early years, I hardly have any memories expect, except like playing outside and um, eating peaches in that area and I'd get itchy around my mouth and that's about it and yeah. get hidings for coming home dirty. 
So, so you lived there until you were five years old. You said. Yeah, until I was like five years old, and um, our parents decided that they wanted to just they wanted us to live in Pretoria, and that's when we moved to Pretoria. Which which part of Pretoria did you spend most of your time? And what I love about podcasts is that at least we don't have music coming or the show's about to end <laughs> or we've got ads coming. We can just we can just take our time and just share. I, I would love to know to get to know you more. You know your story. Okay. Um. I we ended up uh, staying in Pretoria West for the most part, um, West Park, and that's where I really my formative years were there. You know. And we moved around a lot, but that's because my parents are a bit nomadic. They just like people like being around, going everywhere. Uh, we were in KZN every single summer for holidays. It was just like a tradition of ours. And yeah, my dad loves the road. My mom loves cooking and yeah, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah, so when I was searching for your profile online, I saw a lot of uh, people asking questions like, is Lady Zama from Zambia? No, I'm not. Okay, but you, have you gotten that question before? So many times. I've actually seen, because, you know, uh, Wikipedia has a lot of information that is edited by other people. Yeah. So I've seen a lot of information of mine just randomly change on that platform. So whenever people go to, like, um, the internet for information, you realize very quickly that... It's such an unreliable place sometimes because yeah. Yeah. you can have like three different backstories and I prefer if people hear it from me. So no, I'm not from Zambia, but I do have a lot of friends from Zambia and I love the country. Yeah, and, and you're an African. Yeah, I'm an African child and anyone who tries to say anything but that, nah fam. Yeah. yeah. Now let's talk about your education. Um, primary school... I went to Preston Primary School, and then I was in Pretoria West High at some point for grade eight, and then the rest of my high school was in Wishkul Daina in Pretoria Gardens. And I later on went to Lakeview for like a year, and then I went to Varsity, I guess, yeah. And I studied a little bit of accounting, then I went into civil wow. engineering, and eventually I ended up in... Um, a Bachelor of Arts degree course. This this is at what, Techies? No, 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 this is at UNISA. Oh, so UNISA. UNISA offers the underground, um, what am I saying? Undergrad. undergrad. Undergrad of the theory of literature and English as a BA in languages and literature. Okay. So that's like the only university that really offers it like that. Other universities might, but not like that. Yeah. Um, you you are more of a writer than a vocalist, as you were saying to me earlier. What does the love? What did the love for writing start? I think the love for writing is just the love of stories. When I was a kid, my mom would always um, tell us stories about her childhood, about the culture that she, you know, the, the different cultures that she has kind of been raised in. Um, like there was a lot of stories about people, things that I'd never heard of. And I was always engrossed in her little tales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and there was a lot of um, storytelling at church as well and would read books in class. So I guess for me, I was that kid in France who would always have their eyes wide open because I couldn't believe what I was hearing because my imagination just runs wild. And I was always like attentive, attentive. And I think that's where it really started. So when I was in grade five, I think, or grade four, that's when I read my first book that had no pictures. Um, wow. <laughs> I can imagine at that age, Bella, you're, you're bored. You are by so... By books that don't have any pictures. I'm telling you. It you. was like every single book from grade one, grade two, you have these massive pictures with just like a few words and obviously as you get older there's more and more words but I remember grade grade four grade five they I just my my older sister actually was telling me about a book called cross stitch and she was telling me about the story and I was like man I can actually access those stories myself and that's when um I started reading big books mm. I was afraid of big books. Why? Um, I was just intimidated by them. 
So I wasn't one of those people who was in love with reading books, you know? Oh, no. I was one of those on a Friday, I'd throw my school bag in, 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 into the bed and I'll see the school bag as is on Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of those, yeah. yeah so, no. But I mean, I think the love for reading I developed it as, I, as I grew older. But when I was young, I was strat. Yeah, no. We were like punished for going out past five o'clock. We had to be home. So and we had TV time. We had play time. Everything in our household was very like controlled. Extremely controlled. They were strict, no? Very. So one hour of television. We had to choose the hour. Weekends, uh, we got to sleep at 10 o'clock. But we had to actually be in bed at 10 o'clock. Um, yeah, so we were very restricted growing up. So it was very easy for me to develop that love because there was not a lot of distractions. You know, my parents were very strict about the dictionary. We had dictionary homework and school, holi- uh, school holidays all the time. My dad would come back from work and be like, where are your words? You know, so you had <laughs> yeah. to learn like 10 words when you were younger. And as you got older, my dad would increase them. So you'd have to know the spelling and know the meaning. Wow. That is dope parenting, though. <laughs> to a certain degree. What do you think now that you're older? I think that was, um, I think all parents have a lot of flaws, but when it comes to education, my parents were very, very strict about it. They wanted us to learn. And my parents always said that it's the best chance you have because you're growing up in apartheid South Africa. For them, it was traumatic. Um, Having to see so much killing and death and they were very familiar with death, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why they felt like it was it was important for us to grow up in a different area that t- m- might not remind them so much of all the things that happened. Yeah, yeah our parents had it hard. I think they had the worst time. Yeah. And we should be thankful as our generation right now, the kids that were born post or when we matured or got into an age where we could understand apartheid had ended. Mm-hmm. You know, we should be really grateful for them. Yeah. And what do you think right now on, you know, the state of the country? Um, economically, I mean, it's it's the pits right now. I think um, economically our country is just really going through a lot. There's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of uh, unanswered questions that we as society have. There are a lot of... There's a lot of un- inequality in our country. There's a lot of poor, 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 poor people. And then there's rich, 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 rich people. And it's like the imbalance is kind of scary, mm-hmm. you know, especially considering the majority of the people struggling the most are people of color. Because I was in that environment, in a church I already sang, um, I, would, I started writing scripts myself. And then one day... Um, I decided to recite, and then another day I decided to maybe freestyle, incorporate my writing with some of the singing that I do at church, and that's literally how I was discovered. And who discovered you? um, It was a friend of Junior Taurus at the time, who had also just come to the Poetry Society. I don't know what he was doing there, uh, but I later found out that he was also a bit of a singer, artist, etc., etc., etc. And that's basically how it all and like you know came together. Because at church, you're not really ranked according to you're a great singer or you're not a great singer. You know, at our church, especially, there was this thing of we just have to praise God. So I didn't really know that I could sing. You know, I still don't think I can. Ah, uh, listen to her. I, That's what all geniuses say. I kid you not. Because I listen to the voices that send chills down my spine. And I'm like, I can't even begin to sound like that person. Mm, mm. So how on earth can you consider me a great singer when I look at those people as great singers and I don't sound anything like them? Mm. You know, yeah. And have you done any vocal training? Yeah, I, I am, I'm in vocal training like since 2020, I've been uh, in vocal training. Obviously, I take breaks because you can't just be out here exercising all the time and you're not doing anything with it. Yeah. So I take some breaks, and then when it's time to, when it's crunch time again, go back to vocal training. 
so that I can use the techniques and everything that I've learned while in studio. Well, so you grew up in church. You say you used to sing at church. Yeah. Let's talk about your relationship with God and just your, <laughs> your, um, your Christian upbringing. I never, I never trusted Christianity. Hey? I used to think it was a bunch of crap. Uh, maybe now? No, now definitely. But we, we, like going back, yeah. when I first started understanding what it is, I thought Christianity was a bunch of lies. You know, the is what you thought? Yeah, when I was younger, I used okay. to think it was a bunch of lies. Yeah. Uh, because you go to church, and I think a lot of people will, will um, attest to this. You get there, and people will talk about love and kindness and all this stuff. As soon as the service is over, you see all the worst behaviors come out. Mm -hmm. You go to a club, you find people from church there drinking, smoking, doing the most. And that, that those two different images just kind of create this thing of who are the real, who are you? Are you the person at the club six days a week? Or are you the one, that one day of the week person at church? So it, it starts making you think that maybe this thing doesn't even exist. If you can stand in front of a podium, on a podium in front of people and talk about love, loving your family, loving your wife, and then a week later we hear that you were beating your wife or you're an adulterer sleeping around. How do you, as a young person who's not yet come to a place of self-discovery, really think that that can be real, you know? You just look at people posing. So that was my relationship with church at the time and God. So I attended because my parents forced me. Um, it was either that or being grounded or something like worse, possibly getting a hiding. But later on, it was in my matric year that I myself um, started believing. I started reading the Bible from a young age because I was curious about the, the, the book itself, not really the religion. It was more like, I want to understand the book and how it's written and what are the stories. And I was drawn to certain parts of the scriptures. Um, up until matric, that's when I, for myself, decided that, you know what, maybe this is the right thing. It's just that maybe people just don't get it. Maybe the people who are preaching just don't live it. But that doesn't discount the fact that it is real. And having experienced it for myself, having had a God encounter myself, it just dispelled every doubt that I had about it, completely dispelled it. And I was baptized. Um, and from there on, I think my relationship with um, everything sort of changed. You know? Your understanding of spirituality versus religion? I do not. <laughs> I don't know if I should say this. I don't think I should. I'm a, I, believe in, I believe that God is a spirit and he should be worshipped in spirit. Uh, I also respect people's religions. Same here, yeah. And I respect how people want to live their lives and express themselves. But I'm not blind to the effects and some of the consequences of religion um, for the greater society and the greater world. Mm. Yeah. Your understanding of African history? I, I, I think <laughs> African history is... As an African, the only history that is really worth pursuing in terms of knowledge, you know, um, I believe all other history ties in to African history. Because one, we are one of the biggest continents in the world. Two, we, are the, we have numbers that are insane, you know. And I think Africanism has been taken out of context in many, many ways. Because as much as black people, and I like to call black people brown people, brown people have always been the custodians of Africa. But I don't think we were the only custodians. I think people of other color were also custodians. You know, I think all humanity, all of it, originates here. You know, there is no part of the human race, the people race, that does not come from here. And I think we are the strongest in terms of spirituality. Our spirituality is just so deeply rooted. 
And I do believe a lot of it was taken advantage of. I think the nature that we have as human beings, uh, I don't actually like that word human beings, the nature that brown people have was exploited and used against us in many different ways. But at the same time, I do love to encourage people of color to embrace taking responsibility for their own destinies and to not rely so much on foreign things. Because people love to call us foreigners. Mm. I don't think so. Mm. I think there are a lot of other people who are foreign. Mm. Yeah. And I hear your reference a lot to brown people. Maybe let me just understand your explanation or your definition of brown people. I think uh, the, the word black people, I've, I've never liked it. This is black, you know. Black is devoid of all color. You understand? It's like, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, white and black are like opposites. They do the opposite things. Um, and black, the term black for me has always been a bit of a demeaning word, you know. Call me an African. Call me brown. Because I'm definitely not black. And even the darkest shades of brown are still not black. So even if a person looks black, they're actually not because that's not how it works. They're a very dark shade of brown, you know. So do not tell me that melanin, that is literally the epitome of how, of how we as brown people are and what we are that absorbs the sun so easily can then be something that you can call black. I don't, I don't believe in that. I think it's a word that colonialism has created to make us feel inferior and has created this opposite word um, to make people feel like they were superior. And I believe all people are equal to a certain degree in terms of abilities, yeah. Do you feel the, the um, people are calling it an awakening that has been happening all over the world? Some people are calling it the age of the Aquarius. A lot of people are saying people are waking up, people are being more inquisitive. People are researching deeper about their history and just about their African, um, Africanness, you know? I don't know if I would call it an age of awakening. I think the awakening is happening because of the, the, the age of information. We are now so exposed to information. I wake up in the morning, I go on any social media platform, and I'm bombarded, literally bombarded by information, opinions, thoughts um, of other people that I would not have had access to 100 years ago. You know, we had to travel to meet our loved ones. We had to, you know, wait to get letters. Now, I can get what you're thinking immediately, you know, and the fact that the information is so readily available to me now will ultimately create two effects. One, I will become oblivious to it. Like, oh, it's too much. And the other side, I'll be like, what the hell? There's so much, you know, that I need to learn. And I think as people, we are, we are very connected as, as people. The moment you think something, more likely, more often than not, I would have kind of caught on to that, you know? And so the moment I am curious, I meet other people, they become curious, and the information is just so much that we are able to now express that curiosity in a way that allows us to process this information internally and thus make up our own minds without someone forcing their ideologies onto us via just television or just radio, yeah. But also, I believe what the tech companies have done, they've also, I don't want to call it manipulation, but because they own these platforms and with the censoring that has been happening, especially since the lockdown, it yeah. has made me yeah. wake up to the, to the fact that actually what I thought we were, free from the mainstream media and the indoctrination that happens on the other side, it's like now it's even worse here because now it's in my hand. You know what's crazy? The lockdowns. The lockdowns were, I don't know what, besides the, the COVID situation that has happened in the world, 
But what lockdown actually did for a lot of people is exactly that, create awareness. Because now you're alone, right? You, you're not, no one's lying to you. You can choose to watch TV or not, you know. We had a lot more time alone, which had a detrimental effect on society. And it also had a very positive effect on society, where one half is like awakened, you know, to the devices around us. And the other half is just like sad and withdrawn, you know. So I do believe that because of the readiness, you know, there is that thing and the lockdowns also contributed to that. Mm. It's, 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 it's interesting to hear you say that. And I'm, I also want to hear more. I remember I had a chat with you around the lockdown and that's when I was proposing to do this interview. But I think at the time you were busy writing your album. Yes. And then you were like, I'd love to do it. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, but not now. I'm still busy with working. I, I would love to talk to you at least when I've got something done. Yeah. What has happened since then with, with your musical works? Um, or what you've been working on since the lockdown? When I first started writing in the lockdowns, I think I was still writing from a place of defiance, a place of, I'm Lady Zamar, I will be heard, a place of resistance, you know? In 2021, there was a more openness because I started to, the patterns, the patterns of culture, right, are often hid from us when we interact too much. You know, um, I'd like to go back to Picasso, Van Gogh, that time when industrialization became this big thing, post the wars, World War One and Two. Art changed, expression changed, and some people felt it more than others. And I think what happened with the lockdown and my music was that, where we had we had something bad happen to us it was war in its own way people died our friends died our families died and we are we were so resistant to the change that was happening we were so resistant to that and i think for me in 2020 that was that resistance in 2021 it was that acceptance of we have changed we're not the same people that were there before the lockdowns happened, before COVID devastated our world. We're not the same people. We're not listening from the same place. We're not relating from the same place. And that transition had to be made for me in my music, where I had to look at what society is feeling, how they, what they're going through right now. What are people acclimatizing themselves to? What are people attaching themselves to? What is the value that people see in themselves? I can only see that if I can see it in myself. And I started to see that in myself, that I have changed. I have become more accepting of a lot of things that pre-COVID I would have never even thought of, you know? And so I had to write again, because now this was a lot of entitled writing in 2020. 2021, I had to become more open, still a bit resistant, but I had to become more open. It was only in 2022, in January, that I finally came to a full acceptance of the changes in society and in myself. And that's when now my third attempt at putting together my album started. <laughs> hey, I know that process <laughs> as well. Because we are just, we are the heralds of the times. Mm. We have to express them. We have to convey them. And what I love about South African music, especially with Ama Piano now, I wonder if we will only see it as a, as a, as a group much later in life. But as an individual, I see how important this movement is. It, is. it is beyond the music. It is beyond the groove. There's almost a, a lamentation happening, you know, a loss that we're mourning of some sort. And if we do not acknowledge that loss and try to hold on to the semblance of what we were before through the music that we have, through the art that we have, there's this play that um, Mr. John Carney just... Um, you know, put together. Sizwe Banzi is dead. 
Uh, Sorry, not Sizo Banzi is dead. It's, the, uh, it's I think something and the king. Yeah, yeah. It's um I'll tell you just now. Gunene and the king. Yes. Yeah. Um watching that, um, seeing the, the type of stuff that we're creating on Netflix right now, seeing the art that has been created, the canvases being painted, you can see it, you can feel it if you're paying attention, that all of it is connected. We are we are speaking out as Africans, as South Africans, which is why piano is translating. It's translating because there's a, there's a familiarity that we all feel as Africans all throughout Africa. And for those who are connected to Africa, they are feeling it too, because it has become a language of our people right now to say, this is what I am hearing. Africans are driven by, the, by their hearts. They're driven by the beat. They're driven by the rhythms. And if you look at the art close enough, the rhythm is there all throughout. So when people are looking at, at any type of expression, they need to remember expression is about the times. You are not alive now for, by mistake. You're alive now to communicate something to the world. Because unfortunately for us as artists, we are the wounds that bleed for society. But we're also the trumpets that sound really loud when there's joy, you know? Mm. Um, and yeah, that's the journey that I've been on with my music. It's so beautiful. With my journey as well, I kind of felt I am documenting my peers, older, younger, some in my age group, but I'm documenting the times at which we, we're living in. Mm. The biggest mistake that a lot of my generation, obviously I'm your bigger brother, I'm, I'm old school, as you know, uh, in our youth culture language in South Africa, we, we would term it. And not a lot of us recorded our journeys at the yeah. time. I mean, I remember, I can imagine the wealth of history that the Galawa record label possesses. Yeah. And I do know that they recorded a lot of their works, but still, I kind of feel more could have been done with um, Arthur's record label and just their impact in the culture at the time. The SABC dramas that were depicting black people at the time. Those were beautiful. You know what I mean? Just our stories. And I look at our counterparts in America. They document everything. I think I am so sad to not to be alive today and not know Brenda's story fully. Not understand Mira Makeba's story fully. Not know Huma Sekela's story fully. You know, that is for me such a loss, you know. Not understand Fela Kuti, Fela, is it Fela? Oh, Fela, Fela Kuti, Kuti, yeah. There's mm -hmm. Femi Kuti, Fela Kuti, there's lots of sons, there's Sean Kuti, there's... Yeah. But that story not is amazing, Fela. Not know Bob Marley's story mm. in its entirety. Um, not know all these people that have come and gone and departed with all their knowledge, you know, and we don't have enough of it left, you know. Um, looking at Lebo Matosa, who was for me one of, she was such a rebellious queen, you know. I wish I knew more. I wish I understood um, Mam de Bora Fraser more. I wish I understood these people because I feel like those stories would inform us better, of, like would help us figure it out better, help us figure out how we can shake things up more, mm. <laughs> you know, because they were rebellious, mm. you know, the quite the, culture, the Trumpis, those people were just epic. Mm. TKZ. Till today, for me, TKZ remains one of the most epic groups mm. musically. Mm. They're just top tier. Yeah. And that we need to remember at the time also there wasn't social media. So there wasn't easy ways of documenting our stories. Mm. And some of us, sadly, you know, we had to have our stories written on our, on our behalf. By biased minds sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. By biased minds and some minds sometimes with agendas, you yeah. know? And I don't like that and that's why I document my own story, especially right now in this chapter of my life. The earlier years, I also never documented a lot, but at least, by the way, you've just remind, I just remembered, I need to go get my TS Records footage with TK. There's a lot of footage we recorded with the journey of our story as TS Records and I, I think it's probably time to put that work out there. So we've got a responsibility to record our culture. We've got a responsibility to record our stories because if we don't do it, somebody else is going to do it on our behalf. And they won't tell the whole story. And some exactly. parts they will distort. Yeah. So that's how I look at it. So that's why I'm excited to always sit with you guys and, and learn so much. 
But what I love about you is that your mind travels when you write. <laughs> it does. What is your writing process? Um, I draw a lot from me and my environment. Um, I love listening to people talk about their lives. Um, so a lot of people think that the stories I write are my own personal stories. But here's the weird thing about me. If you share your story with me, it becomes my personal story because your story becomes a part of me. So it's not necessarily I have lived those experiences. Sometimes those experiences are vicariously lived through other people and then I get the privilege of putting them down. And it's, it's a lot. It's actually sometimes too much. So I have to always, you know, ration myself and say, okay, you can't, you can't, you can't go there, you can't go there, maybe not that, maybe not this. So my writing process is pretty simple. I figure out what is playing in my head. I figure out what melodies are there. And then I create the stories according to that melody, yeah. according to that structure. There was a time I saw two girls fighting outside a club. And I remember watching them and just writing a story immediately on the spot. On the about, spot. Yeah, <laughs> about that little tiff that I saw. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I draw from other people's songs, like um, with one of the songs that people love the most, Charlotte. It was actually written from listening to Dolly Parton's Jolene and then thinking... Oh, Jolene, Jolene, yeah. Thinking about, hmm, I wonder how she must have felt. I wonder what it was in the beginning. And what if it wasn't Jolene? What if it was somebody else? What kind of person was Jolene? You know, and just going into that process of that song... And then I was like, you know what? If I was her, I wouldn't be asking Jolene, leave my man. I would be, I would be lamenting and saying, I want to be with this person on my own. I want to be by myself. But at the same time, what if Jolene was just a figment of her imagination? What if there was no Jolene? What if a man was just busy, you know? And that's where the Charlotte concept came about, where it doesn't have to be a person. It can be something that is stealing a person away from you. So it, that's where there's, there's no clear, hey, it's a woman. Because even the word Charlotte was derived from the word charlatan. Because a charlatan is a person who's deceptive. And I figured creating that name Charlotte would be honoring the charlatan, you know, name, the word. Yeah. And it introduced into the market um, as a vocalist on a what people would deem a house song. Yeah. And the market usually boxes musicians, especially when you're still new. I hate that so much. And let's talk about that. Um, the market does tend to decide for you. And unfortunately, because we're driven by our ego sometimes, and we're driven by our hubris, where we think we are actually the best at it because people tell us we're the best or we have tested it out, we tend to, as musicians, as artists, walk into those boxes that people create. So when people say, you are this, a lot of us from fear, uh, anxieties, past traumas, the need to be accepted, the need to please the ego, we walk into those boxes and we the ones who put this big old chain around it and we block it. And we then find ourselves locked into a narrative that we did not create. You just loved the music. You just liked making that type of thing. And sometimes it's not even a, like with me, it's not even a, a like of a genre. It's just, it spoke to me at that time. And society has this thing where the moment you want to take yourself out of that, they're like, oh my gosh, you have betrayed the genre. And like, <laughs> yeah. how? I came in here as a musician. I didn't learn how to make house music. I learned how to sing, you know? If there's a producer who wants to make house and that's his life and bread and butter, that's fine. But don't box me in, you know? And sometimes you get excited by the adrenaline of it all, where you're like, you identify that this is actually more acceptable to people. So then you gravitate towards that because you want to make money and make a living, you know? And I, I don't think anything is wrong with that. Like, as if there is something you can do to make yourself um, live and experience life a better way, then do it. But do not force yourself into these categories. And unfortunately, even the music streaming platforms today 
they they force us into categories where you are this artist, you are that artist. There there are no spaces, you could say, for people to just be free. Mm. So you kind of have to play it safe all the time. Mm. You know, yeah. That's the restriction. But but do you classify yourself as a particular genre singer no. type of an artist, or are you musician. just a musician? I'm a musician who has certain, you know, um, likes and dislikes, but I can do it all, you know. If I wanted, if I want to, if I put my mind to anything, as an artist, because that is what I am, an artist. Mm. I can create from anywhere. Yeah. So then there was Cotton Candy. That was your first album. Yeah, with Junior Torres. It was a collaborative album. Yeah. yeah. And let's talk about that experience. You were new in the industry, traveled, and you sort of started getting used to the industry. You grew um, before moving on to your next project. But what, would you, what did you learn from that experience of that album? Everything. Working with Junior Torres was... It was educational. I think that's the best way to put it. I learned a lot about myself, what I could do. You know, I learned a lot about my voice's capabilities. Mm. I learned that you can make money. (laughs) 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 The first time I got money, I think it was like 250. Yeah. (laughs) And I was so shocked because I grew up singing in church and I never got paid. You know, so I, I can travel. get paid doing this. Yeah, 250 bucks. Yeah. Who's going to give you 250, you know, <laughs> just for existing? Yeah. Nobody does that, you know? So I got 250 rand, and I'm a student, and I'm thinking, I, I just had to sing. And then it became 1,000, it became eight, there was 800, 1,000, 800, 5,000, 10,000. You were like, whoa. And then the gigs start coming. Yeah. Whoa, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. insane. <laughs> And I think that is one of the most in, important lessons um, I learned, that you really can make a living of something that you genuinely like and do effortlessly, you know? Um, but the, the writing as well, um, because I'm an academic, I never had thought to write for people who are not um, academically inclined to understand that particular topic. You know, so if you were to give me, like, a a science paper, right? For a person who studies accounting, you just give them an entire science journal, they will be so flabbergasted, like, what the hell? (laughs) You know, even though you understand the the language, because it's in a language that you can read, but to understand how it works is crazy. So writing uh, circular music, you know, commercial music was an experience, because now... I have to write for a lot of people. I'm not writing for me, you know? I also can't be very cryptic with my messages, (laughs) you know? And I can't explain in 10, 20 lines. I have to make sure that I get the message across in in the fewest words possible. Mm. And that's what I had to learn. You know, people think it's it's an easy thing. I think writing as a, in a general sense is, well, is a very hard thing mm. because you're never writing for yourself unless you're writing in your journal, you know, but you're never writing for yourself. So you always have to, you know, remember that. And then how to then create the melodic impact with the words, you know. So you also kind of, I started realizing that I could actually say nothing and it would have an impact because of the emotions that are, coming across in my voice and in, in how I, and I learned the importance of the studio, you know, to respect the microphone, respect the fact that as, as technology, as, 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 as much as this is technology, it actually has such a spiritualness to it because you convey energy through another um, platform that then lives on as energy and that energy that you have exuded out of your body lives on in a technical sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's going to live it on forever. Blew my mind, you know. Um, and that's the thing about um, Cotton Candy. Learning. It was a learning experience. Mm. It was learning every day of that album. Even up until the day um, myself and Junior split up, it was still learning, you know. Yeah. You did uh, a track there called Bitori. 
Because <laughs> <laughs> I always say people's first albums are like their entire lives. And for the first time, they've got this opportunity to just share with the world. I don't see Cotton Candy as my first album. I see King Zamar as my first yeah. album. Because Cotton Candy was, a lot of it was Junior's vision. Oh, okay, I get you. I was simply a person who was writing and a conduit for his vision. I get you. And what he wanted to do. And I, which is why I say it's a learning experience for me because I was learning what, what, it, what it all means, you know. So he created that. But Bitori, he asked me to write that song and said, um, I should just write my experiences of what do I think Pretoria is. And because I'm a very proud Pretorian, like, travel the whole world if you want, but you'll never find a place like Pretoria. Yeah, yeah. I've it lived is, in Pretoria for a couple of years. It's beautiful. So, <laughs> oh, so there. Sure. Like, 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 far. <laughs> like, that's far. Like, that's like, what, the north, 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 north. Like, but Kiko Kas. You know, you're not in Pretoria until you've been to Lesosha, Atridgeville, Mamelodi, Mamelodi, you know? The energy is insane, oh, right? Guys, <laughs> and shout out to one of my Pretoria um, guys, DJ Somebody. I, I always want to show him love. Uh, he's always been a proponent of Pitori Daman. Yeah. And I love, I love how DJ uh, Somebody always puts money in my pocket every, every year when it's my birthday. He's like, Khrutman, can I host you? And then he just gives me a check. And Aww. just come through to the club. It's up to you whether you want to play, you don't want to play. I'm like, wow, this guy always puts money in my daughter's pocket, you know? So let me just shout him out. Shout outs to DJ Sambori, Lipitoria Laka. I know him from when he was starting his career back in the day. Very proud of you. Very proud of everything you achieved, bro. Yeah. And thank you for the love that you always show me every year during my birthday. You're not showing it to me. You're putting money into my daughter's pockets every year. Even if it's just two rands. I just want to let you know... Um, People like myself are always used to giving to others. So for me, I always appreciate it. Even if somebody just gives me a two cents or somebody just gives me a cup of coffee. Yeah. It's always like, wow, you know, I'm being appreciated. So, Mr. DJ, somebody I love yeah. Pretoria too. Nah, it's a beautiful place. And somebody's a really cool guy. <laughs> yeah, he knows yeah. himself. <laughs> People love somebody. First know? time I heard of him, I was like, they kept saying DJ somebody. I'm like, huh? Somebody. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> but he's got such a unique personality. Very chilled guy. Positive yeah. spirit, yeah. yeah. And I like people that come from the streets and, and sort of evolve and grow their lives and turn, in, turn it into some amazing, yeah. take it into some amazing levels, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we are all evolving, evolving in this life thing. We're all learning. We're students of life, you know? 100%. Nobody has this entire thing figured out. We've all doing it for the first time. Yeah. None yeah. of us has had a practice run. Yeah, I totally agree. Let's talk about your current music now. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited about that. Um, are you? I am. I I'm excited. probably more excited about your music than you. <laughs> um... It's been it's been difficult, but um, I finally think I have the hang of it, right? Um, delving into the more local sound, delving into parts of myself that um, I had decided to kind of put away, you know, getting back into that space of writing songs that are short but impactful, songs that are almost like chance you could say you could uh i don't even know how to explain the music that i'm making right now to be honest with you you know it's different um i'm also drawing from a lot of inspiration that i've had in the past with other musicians you know not me myself and i um and working with producers i've met so many producers that are incredibly talented incredibly talented people that have worked on themselves, worked on their music, and when I get the privilege to meet them, I get almost like the best of them. Mm, you know? I get you. Yeah. So I've met quite a lot of people, and these people have been contributing to um, my music. Yeah, not else to say. <laughs> I can see you're very <laughs> careful with what you're sharing. <laughs> Yeah, because I know myself. I've got like verbal diarrhea sometimes. <laughs> so I just like, and I forget. Because I always forget that the stuff lives on platforms Forever. that mm. people can go back to. And 
you know, nitpick. Because in today's society, for some reason, people are so mad. They're so angry. <coughs> That's why so, politicians always get caught out. Because you know, <laughs> yeah. a lot of them lie a lot. Yeah. They say the one thing, and then people are like, ah, ah, papa. They go and grab a video of something they exactly. said. And they come back. It wasn't this you. So I'd rather not. Social media has a tendency to twist your words, take snippets of an interview. And yeah, yeah. So I'm very careful with what I say, especially when it comes to things that affect me directly. No, so, I get yeah. you. But our platform is a very positive platform and it's an educational platform, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, and I appreciate the fact that you, you, you number one, agreed to come and um, during the lockdown and then, you know, you fulfilled that promise just right when the stuff is about to, to come out. Maybe roughly, when do you think we should expect the works? Um, another song, because I, I released a song in April. Um, it's also, that was like a, a song that we put out to just figure it out as well. So there's a song coming just now now. Uh, and possibly the, the works should be ready summer. Summer, ne? Summer 2022. Okay. Before the end of the year, okay. Yeah, spring, summer, there. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm a person who still believes in a body of work. I also believe it. Like, I don't understand this thing. I'm just like out there, one, one. I get it, but I also believe that you need to show people who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. And I kind of feel uh, we, we, we're not ready. We get once, we're still working in studio. One song goes out, it catches some sort of a buzz, we're already on the road. You have not had time to find yourself, you have not had time to be in studio, put in the work, record a body of work. And but I, just think, I think that's also, it's, it's, it's on us too. I mean, we should, yes, when you first start out in the industry, you don't have a lot of control. You know, you, you, you're unsure. You're, it's time sensitive. You gotta make an impact. But you get to a point where after your first project or the first two, three big songs, you have to be responsible for yourself at that point. You have to be able to say to people, I need time. I need you to give me a break because one thing is for sure. Good music, good musicians do not run out of style, you know. And you need to trust yourself to say that I am able to take a break for like a couple of weeks to figure myself out because when I do come back and say, guys, I'm now on tour or I am now performing, you do it to the best of your ability and you can't give people half measures. And if you try and do that thing of you have this big song and then you run into it, you are going to give people bits and pieces of yourself and you won't be able to fully show people who you are. You know? I so I think you. we have to be responsible. It's 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 right to for people to want us to keep and to own but it's also right for you as an individual to say i'm not ready for that mm. yeah. i also i also say to people it's okay to say no yes i don't know why where this thing came from where you can't say no mm. like why are you a bad person for mm. saying no i actually think it's the people who I have this weird theory if you're a people pleaser you're actually the worst type of manipulator yeah. You know? Oh, wow. If you're a people pleaser, you're actually the worst type of manipulator. Wow. Yeah, don't because, say that. Wow. No, because, listen, people actually, pleasing, yeah. I am. I used to be a people pleaser and I still Yo, sometimes have those same here. qualities. You are not being honest. And honesty should be the highest of your, of your aspirations in life. You have to live an honest life. If you are going around not being honest with yourself... For the sake of other people that will die and will probably forget about you if you died, you know, you are disservicing yourself mm. and the place that you have in this world the most. And you are creating false expectations in other people because now they think they can use you, right? Mm. And then you get to a point where you're like, I'm no longer usable, you understand? And now they feel betrayed. You get what I mean? Mm. It's easy to point fingers and say, that person is a narcissist, that person is an abuser, but you have to also take responsibility for the fact that, yes, we all have trauma. We all have pain. But you have to get to a point where you can reel yourself in, and that takes time, and it takes years. You understand? And if you're a people pleaser because you're unaware of it, that's, so, that's okay. I know not being aware of something, you cannot be blamed for it. But when you get to a point where you're now aware that actually, you know what, I go around trying to make people happy at my expense, 
you then are, are, are utilizing manipulation tactics to get people to like you. And that's wrong. Mm. I shouldn't really speak about this. <laughs> it's so true, though. Steve Jobs even says it. He says the secret to success is saying no. You have to know. And then I was like, what is this man saying? And I listened to the talk. I was like, wow, I totally get him. I think it would be okay if I was just a public speaker, but I'm also an artist. <laughs> yeah. So when I say stuff, it's got different. It means something different. I, I know, to the people out there, right? Yeah. But, but it's incredible. Guys, we need to look after ourselves. You come first. You can't keep on over, uh, but in filling other cups when you're not overflowing. You have to focus on being content with the who you are. The point is to overflow. Yes. A lot of people don't realize that it's not just about filling your cup. Fill the cup so that it overflows. The overflowing fills other people's cups. And that's the thing. Filling your cup is not just about being selfish. It's also allowing people to fill you, you know. And allowing people to fill you is a, is a balance of saying yes and no. You say yes for the things that you know will grow you. And you say no to the things that you know will diminish you, mm. you know. So being about yourself and loving yourself should really become about being able to be strong enough to love someone else. Because that is the goal. If you're just going to become an obese person emotionally, just an obese, because you've, you've loved yourself so much, mm. now you're just fat inside, mm. you know? You, you have to get to a point where you love yourself so much for the goal of being able to love other people. I get you. Yeah. And let's go back into the actual current album that you're working on. Should we? Uh, have, you, have you set it up as to I'm doing 10 tracks? Yes, I have, I have set it up to a number. Yeah. I've also set it up to a certain expectation for myself in terms of topics yeah. to discuss. Um, where I'm going to go, where I'm not going to go. Where are you going to go? Um, focusing a lot more on the honest realities of life and not some fantasy. I have a tendency, I had a tendency to want to always write music that is perfect. Music that conveys the perfect message even though a lot of my music is actually quite dark but there was always this tendency to make sure that no one sees the cracks um i've, I've been in the public eye for quite some time even way before there was social media i'm actually glad as much as it's worse now but it's better because we are able to express ourselves back um into the public i'm able to tweet out and post something on my facebook and say that's a lie Yes. Or I'm able to speak for myself. Yeah. But I come from an era where that wasn't that easy. Shoashui writes you out on Sunday and he bangs you with another article two Sundays <laughs> later. And then he bangs you with three more articles a month later. And then it messes up your bag. It messes up your endorsement, your reputation. And sometimes you find that more than half of those, not even half, probably almost all of that information 95 is not true. percent of it is not true. And it's unfair, you know, but I kind of feel right now at least... We're living in an era where we are able to speak on our behalf. You have been you have been in the public eye also over the past couple of years, and you've also had your own fair share of positive and negative um, energy from the people out there. Have you been Have you learned enough to be able to to handle it, or does it affect you still? It affects me still, and for me to say anything else would be a total lie. Mm. I sometimes get extremely touched and triggered, and sometimes. I become an emotional mess by some of the things that I read. And if it wasn't for the people that I have in my life and my team and my family, I wouldn't have survived half of the things that I've been through in the social media spaces. Mm. Because they remind me every single time that one, it's okay to feel that way. Two, it's not the truth. You know the craziest thing about the human mind? You can teach it anything. Mm. You can teach me to hate myself. You can teach me to think I'm inferior, you know. But that is if you allow it. Yes. But also, we are not strong enough alone to not allow it. So we need people in our lives that will lift us up when we cannot do it for ourselves. And I've been so privileged and so blessed to have people like that in my life who constantly tell me um, it's not true you can do this you are not limited by these people they don't know you without diminishing their humanity and their freedom of speech you know um, also learning how to say no to people is not just a thing of saying no to them personally 
sometimes even saying no to the social media users by just pressing the block button mm. and saying, I'm no longer giving you access to target me, to say things about me. And that's something you learn because before you become a public figure, you have no idea what it's like. There's no education. Mm. Mm -mm. You, there isn't in, in South Africa. And Nobody I, prepares you for it. I wish we were actually taught that. Mm. I wish in South Africa labels would create a space where they would teach um, their artists how to handle, how to handle their private lives, how to handle information, choosing who to date, who to be friends with. Because sometimes the people that r literally destroy everything that you build or try to are the people that you let into your life yourself. Mm -hmm. You open the door and you're like, come in, come in, come in. And they're the ones who end up going to the media. They're the ones who end up... Because people will not discredit a person who spends so much time with you. So they could lie to someone. And then people believe that person because of the fact that they're close to you. So if, if we could just, as a culture, or even in schools who are specialized in arts and stuff, teach that, especially in Africa, that there are ways. And also go back to teaching the people who report the news to be sympathetic maybe sometimes and to be very objective and not biased. Because sometimes even the things that are said about you in, in public forums are biased, you know? And it would be nice, It's a, in a perfect world, in a perfect world, it would be nice to have that training and to know how to handle yourself. And again, I've been so blessed to have that. I remember I got media training. I studied, luckily, in, in, in school, social, I mean, the whole media engine, you know, communications. I studied a lot of things that allowed me to, to a certain extent, know and understand where to look for help as well and how to look for help and how to address some of these things. And having a mother who, when I was at my lowest point, when I felt so suicidal, said to me, instead of appealing to my, oh my gosh, my child, why would you want to do this to yourself? Said to me, sat me down and said, understand that you are in a place right now where everyone is watching. They're waiting for you to do something crazy. They're waiting for you to say something crazy. And this is the time where I need you to be the strongest that you've ever been and to say nothing, to do nothing, and to just smile every day and walk around like nothing's wrong. You know, having that support system is everything to a person who is constantly in the public, you know. And also having the discipline as, again, walking away from your own ego not trying to always protect yourself because as much as it's now easy to say, fight back and say, oh my gosh, it's a lie, it's this and this and this, there's also a time and a place for that, you know? You can't just now be all willy-nilly trying to attack every single person that, try to attack, that tries to attack you. The Bible says that argue with a fool, you will sometimes be seen as a fool. Argue with a fool, sometimes you will teach the fool. So sometimes you don't actually know what's the right moment. Mm -hmm. What if today I'm arguing with a clown and then I also <coughs> look like a clown? Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes battling the lie makes you look like an even bigger liar. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes sometimes advocating for the truth makes you look desperate. So you have to know exactly how to do it. And I was, I was, and I'm not perfect. And I've done, I've made so many mistakes in social media, but I have always had the support of my family, my friends, my team, my label. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Mm. Like, eternally grateful. I'm grateful for your team because I've just heard you say something along the lines of, at some point, you were suicidal. Yeah. What happens in the mind of a person who gets suicidal as obviously is what you'd call depression, right? What would you share that you think would help somebody out there who's probably going through similar currently right now? Um, so I bet you call this um, mental health. Yo, you cannot put a price on that health. We always talk about our physical health. You know, oh my gosh, you know, got to be fit, exercise. But we don't speak enough about the effects of the mind on the body. You know, um, you have to guard your mind with everything you got there is no price 
that is high enough for you to pay to have your mind disrupted and corrupted. Depression is a very complicated disease. It is, we suffer from it in different degrees, all of us. I have had my fair share of mental illness, you know, and mental problems and mental stuff. But what I can say is, no matter how bad a situation looks, stay present. Stay here, stay in the now. Stay with the moment, the cup of tea that you're drinking. Stay with the shower that you're taking. Stay with the TV program that you decide to watch right now. Try by all means, especially when you feel so down, to not go backwards. Don't look back. You know mm. that, that thing, don't go back to the moment that hurt you. Don't go back to that moment that you regret. Regret is the biggest killer. Mm. It will make you feel and think and what, what you can project into a future, something that has not yet happened because of how you feel right now. You could make a mistake for tomorrow, today, just because of where your mind is, you know? And it is something that you should never take for granted. The moment you start to feel any type of despair, sorrow, depression, talk, speak, we were created to be connected to each other. I know a lot of black people do not, you know, they will dismiss, especially men, no offense. <laughs> Um, I've had a lot of uh, guys I've, I've, I've been seeing or dated or whoever at some point say to me, so you pay someone to talk to them? And I'm like, you don't understand. I'm not paying for them, for me to talk to them. I'm actually paying for them not to try to change my mind. I'm actually paying for them to listen freely without any bias. I'm paying for them to not be my brother or my sister at that point. Because sometimes even the people who are trying to take you out of that depression can create more of it, mm. you know? So learn to speak about it. Find safe spaces where you can actually tell a person how you really feel without being worried and scared about how they're going to react to what you're saying, you know? Um, depression is a real, serious, serious, serious disease. And it can be affected by so many things in your life, your environment, your hormones. And keep, don't push people away. I know that's harder said mm. <laughs> than done. Because mm. when you are feeling depressed, you will want to close yourself off. But allow space, man. Give yourself space, you know. And I have been at that place where nothing makes sense. I don't want anything. I want to escape myself. <laughs> I want to get out of my own skin. Mm. And I've been to that place where I regret. And I'm like, I wish I never did. I wish I never said. I wish I never. I wish. But the more you do that, the more you sink deeper into it. So for anyone suffering from depression, stay present. Stay here. Stay in the breathing. Even if it means staying in the breathing, just take a moment and be conscious of your breath. Be conscious of the, the act of being alive. And that will help you. Yeah. They say musicians create or produce some of their greatest works when they're going through the most. You know? Lies. Um, <laughs> why are you saying it's lies? How can you? <laughs> You're pouring out. But how can you create from a place of darkness? Well, some people say the musicians create the best work. Because we've heard some musicians pouring their hearts out onto the beat, pouring their hearts out, and the songs becomes, the songs connect with the people. But not at that time. You actually make your, the best music when you've come out of the darkness, not in the darkness. Because in the darkness, you can't see. You don't know what's what. It's only when you've come out of the darkness that you can see the darkness. You know, what is this? this it's like a frog, right? When you put it in a pot of boiling water doesn't know that it's burning that's exactly what darkness is like compared to pain and sorry you don't actually know how bad it was until you get out only when you get out can you then perspectively see it and be like whoa mm. wow, that was heavy you know and I think that's the misconception that people have musicians don't create from the darkness they don't create in the darkness they come out of the darkness. And when they're at their best places in life, they can then go back and see the darkness I for what you. it actually was. I create better when I'm inspired. What creates inspiration? I'm inspired by different things. And it depends on whatever I'm going through at the time. 
and I'm talking about um, from the music side. And I believe because we are all artists, we can create anything. Right now we're creating content, I, I, you know, I create, I write books, which is another topic I'd like for us to talk about. Like your, your writing, is it only going to end up in the music space or are you going to grow this writing? Are you going to write movies, stories? Are you going to write books? Are you going to write film? Yeah, one step at a time. I'm actually, I just, um, I'm releasing a book. Oh, lovely. <laughs> well done. Well done. It's yeah. not a lot of people that um, <laughs> write and finish a book, just yeah. one book. It took me about, it took me like a week to finish the book. Also, you, also you've written it? Yeah, I finished. It's already coming out. Um, it's going to be on, on people's shelves yeah. in August. Look at you. You're talking as if it's... <laughs> why didn't you tell me this? So you got a book coming. Yeah, but it's a children's book. That is so... To. That's even more dope. <laughs> it's a starting point. Tell me about it. Um... I've always wanted to publish. I've had written stuff for so long, you know? And I shopped around during lockdown because, you know, they kept to talk about multiple streams of income. Yeah, that was us. <laughs> but DJ Spool, the motivational speak. Yeah, so <laughs> I was like, you know, I actually have such, such vast skills in art, especially. Um, let me see. And I reached out to a couple of publishers. Some of them were interested, some of them seemed a bit dodge, and then eventually, through Brand Cartel, which is an agency I signed to for outside of music work, um, they then got me into Penguin um, Random House, and they said they would love to get a manuscript. I wrote the manuscript. Wow, yeah. First draft, they're like, oh my gosh, can I piece of tissue? Oh, can I piece of tissue, bro? First draft, they were like, no, this is not it. And they're like, go back to the drawing board. I was not inspired. I was upset that they didn't like my story. Yeah. But I was like, okay, I mean, but you got to do this, you know? So I wrote the second book and they loved it. <laughs> so you've written two books? For kids, but for yeah. myself, I've written, um, yeah, I've actually written two books for myself, but which have not yet come out. And the children's book, that was the first one. And the second one is the one that they approved. Uh, I'm, I'm so impressed. Uh, you put in work. <laughs> so you've been working. You've got four books that you've written. So which one specifically is coming out uh, in August, September this year? Um, it's called Amara. Amara goes to the Olympics. It's about a girl, a little, little, little girl who, um, she's just weak. She's a very weak little child. Thank you. And eventually she gets out of the hospital goes to school, realizes that they're going to be... Take your time, take your time, it's okay. No, it's okay. Oh, okay. Uh, realizes they're going to be school Olympics, and then she qualifies to one of the, you know... It's, it's a cute little book. It's really <laughs> a cute little book. You see, I've got an eight-year-old. That's why I'm interested. <laughs> oh, yeah, Because no. you already have a client just She's going to love it. Like, <laughs> yeah. I remember when my mom read this, the story, she calls me, she's like, oh, my... Poor Amara. <laughs> and I was like, what? She's like, oh my gosh. She's, she was so proud of this character. Yeah. And speaking to, the, to the, the illustrators as well, they were just like talking about how proud they are of this little character. And they're like, Amara is just so strong and she's so confident and she's so, she overcomes um, so much for her to become this person at the end of the book. You know, and I won't lie, I was super proud of her too, you know. Ah, that is so beautiful, man. Yeah. What do you want to take this writing um, skill that you have and this writing talent? Before, before music, I always wanted to be an internationally renowned writer. Um, I think in my third year, I went on Wikipedia and there was this thing of famous African writers. And I, I remember putting in my name Wow. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and then yeah. it came out red because there's no reference. <laughs> yeah, at the time, yeah. <laughs> so now, hopefully, because um, I'll actually be a published author, yeah. a lifelong dream of mine. Thank you. And um, I hope to win awards. Uh, I hope to speak because I, I do have the book tour coming up as well. Well, I'll be reading the book. Um, you know, to kids, and nice. I'm so excited. You have no idea. I'm so happy for you because I'm also an author. I write. Yeah, I have your book. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you've got it. <laughs> yes, uh, thank I you. have your book. <laughs> yes. 
I, I love, like, I can't wait to, to, um, to drop another book. Yeah. So that's why I'm so impressed and I'm so happy for you. Yeah. And now that you're talking about, um, you know, dropping your, your children's book and the, the tour that is upcoming, I can even see how glowing you are. Your face just lights up. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's just a passion of mine. Like, I believe education should not be denied to children. And not every single child is going to have the privilege of going to a formal school, but if they can have access mm. to one book that can make them want it, mm. make them want success, that is enough. All you need is that spark in mm. a child that makes them want to do something. And by that alone, they can achieve anything, you know. And writing for that age group is difficult. I don't like because they, they don't have much of an attention span. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So getting a book that actually kind of makes people feel like, oh, yay, you know, is like super cool. <laughs> so, so how are you going to work on dropping the book and, and the album? Are you going to do the book first or how is that going to? Yeah, the book is definitely coming out first. Okay. Um, it's coming. It's confirmed. The book is confirmed for August um, this year. Women's Month. I did not know that. Yeah, it is. In all the years I've been alive. <laughs> <laughs> We're in Youth Month now. It'll be Women's Month, yeah. Yeah. It's so three months I get, away. I get to have this beautiful period of time where I get to spend with kids and teach them. And then after that, we get back to the glitz and the glam. <laughs> <laughs> on stage. Now, let's, yeah. talk, let, let's talk about... the. See, on, on, the, on the podcast, we always ask our guests to recommend some books, either a book... Three books. So either some of them might have, might have been a book that changed your life okay. or just books that you'd like to recommend to our audiences out there. Uh, definitely the first book that comes to mind is Ian Levan Sound, In the Meantime. In the Meantime. Okay, I've very, heard a lot about very, it. Very, very, very beautiful book. You know, helps you compartmentalize and figure out your life in so many different ways. Um, a, a book I'm reading right now is The Laws of Human Nature, Robert Greene. Robert Greene. Very, very, yeah. very good book. I love him as an author. I love his, I love, I love, is it Outliers? Uh, I don't know. I love also. I just know the two books, The 48 Laws of Power. Oh, sorry, 48 Laws of Power, yeah. yeah. He's too dope. Yeah, he's an amazing <laughs> he's dope, writer. Yeah. And the third book, ugh, where do I start? Mmm. I don't know because like there's so many titles swimming in my mind. Yeah. But I think I will recommend. What's my favorite Disney fairy tale? <laughs> Why fairy tale? <laughs> I learned. I mean, most of the things I learned about life were really like from fairy tales. Mm. You know. Um. I would actually. I don't know, but let me just go with the Disney, right? I would recommend Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Why? Because that story teaches that you should not judge a person from the way they look. Mm. Rather judge a person from how they behave towards you and what they show you, you mm. know. And be very kind of caring towards people even though they might not look the way you, you want them to look. It actually teaches a lot of tolerance. Yeah. yeah. Mm, lovely. This is so incredible to and hear your story. the girl, Belle, she loves books. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's a reader. She's a reader. Okay, no, that's good to hear. I also want to know about your musical inspirations. I did hear you earlier speak about uh, the great Umama Brenda Fasi, may I so rest in peace. Umama Merema Keba, Ukoko Koko Merema Keba, may her so rest in peace. I've heard you mention Lebo Matosa, who are some of you? Also passed. Yeah. <laughs> Sad. Um, my inspirations musically... Ella Fitzgerald, she's uh, somebody that somebody recommended to me to check her voice. Legend. But then I ended up just loving the way she writes and her stories and her quirkiness. And it's beautiful, you know. Um, another person that really like shaped a lot of me, it's the, the normal Beyonce, you know. She has this emotive voice that is unmistakable. Especially in our earlier works, there was a lot of emotion that you could hear in her music, you know, and I love that about her. Um, Brenda Farsi, and not Weekend Special. I actually listen to her other stuff yeah. most of the time. Um, she has one of the most gripping stories, you know, in South African music history. And she also has 
a beautiful she had a beautiful voice a very raw it was raw like reminds me of um cocoa butter it's very raw it's very african you know like mm. cocoa butter mm, mm. <laughs> um and then who else do i really really like in terms of music dolly parton yeah Absolutely loved her story writing. I was know. brainwashed into Dolly Parton when I was still young. I grew up Why in the salon. Why would you call it? Because, <laughs> because my mom used to play Dolly Parton from Exen until Ntambahama the whole weekend. And I, had to, I was forced to be in the salon on weekends. But she has so many albums. It was just only Dolly Parton playing. No, not one album. That's why I know all of her music. Okay. Oh, if you go, I'll follow you. I know about... Chabo Jolene, I know them. I even know the songs she did about Kenny Rogers. Mm. The Christmas songs. Like, you know, I miss me as a kid. She was amazing, I agree. But she was she brainwashed you. <laughs> My mom brainwashed me into this blonde old white woman <laughs> called Dolly Parton <laughs> was an amazing vocalist at the time. Yeah. So no, I also love Dolly Parton's music. I'm just yeah. taking a swap at my mom's. I don't think she'll watch this film. <laughs> but because it's oh she'll watch it. I don't know. I hope she doesn't watch up until here. Yeah, because I think we'll be speaking for about an hour. So I hope my mom doesn't watch up and like, oh, I'm in trouble. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see what happens. What am I going to do? I'm going to introduce you to the party. Yeah, no. It's, yeah, there's a lot of people I can't even mention. Them. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm so proud of you and congratulations on everything you've achieved. Thank you. Yeah, may you just keep on growing and may all your dreams come true. Thank you. You know? I can't wait to see you win all of those awards and become what you are meant to become. But more importantly, I can't wait to see you inspire more younger girls. I hope I do. Yeah, as, as a father of a, a baby girl, when I look at um, people who are passionate about young girls' yeah. um, duties and issues and they're doing something to address them, I always root for them. So the fact Thank that you're you. already writing a children's book and when you talk about it, you're already, your face just lights up. <laughs> It just means that our daughters have got role models, you know, and I'm looking forward to sharing your, your book with her. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. Before I let you go, um, I'm going to ask you to speak to that camera over there. I'm going to send... One. Yeah, that one. I'm going to send you this video in about 10 years from time, from now. I'll be gray. I'll be old at the time. 10 years from... Not even 10. Let's say 20. 20 years from now, I'll be 53. No, not 53. I'll be 63. I'm 43 now. Um, yeah, so that's 20 years from today. You'll probably have grandchildren by that time. I don't know. Doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> but what would you like to say to yourself 20 years from today? We'll send you this video, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, what would you like to say to that amazing woman over there? You are everything you've always wanted to be. And it started a couple of years back, and I'm super proud of you. Yeah. Thank you. And then I'd like for you to look at the camera and say, hi, everybody, I'm Lady Zamal. You know, I won't lie to you. That light is, like, blinding me. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. I am uh -huh. such, I am a musician or whatever your title that you'd like to. Uh, I'm, hi, I'm Lady Zama. I am such and such and such. And I've just been hustled by DJ Swoo on the Hustler's Corner. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Lady Zamar. I'm a musician, a writer, and a whole lot of other things. And I've just been hustled by DJ Spoo on the Hustlers Corner. Yeah. Bo, 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 bo. Bo, bo, thank you so much, Mdanse Kanya Bongane. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you for your time. What an incredible interview. This didn't even feel like an interview. I know, right? I know, but it was so dope. I'm just looking forward to the rest of your work coming out, like the book coming out, the album That's coming out. The book. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for you. This is The Hustler's Corner.